Hey everybody, Adam Savage here in my cave. Um, good to see you all. I was, I was on Amazon the other day and I was adding some books to my maker library. I realized that I have a maker library here. It's a bookshelf. I have a couple of bookshelves full of books that I've been collecting about the making of things forever. Uh, and on this bookshelf are things like leather braiding manuals and encyclopedias of glass blowing and stained glass and watch repair, all sorts of different things. Every time someone recommends a book as an excellent book within the genre of making, uh, Ted Woodford recommended a guitar book recently and he said this is a seminal tome of uh, information about guitar repair. I put it in my library. I just love knowing from an expert that I've got like a great tome. But it also caused me to think about older books, books that I grew up with that I don't have in my library. Um, and speaking of libraries, I spent my childhood going to a library every weekend. That was one of our prime entertainments in my family is my mom took us to Warner Library in uh, Sleepy Hollow, Terrytown, New York. Um, and I went there every Saturday or Sunday. In fact, it was also one of my very first jobs. I was a, a library page working for Mrs. Sapashkov. She was scary. <laughs> Amazing. But like to a 14 year old, she was like a very austere German woman. You didn't want to, you didn't want to go crosswise with her. But, um, at the library, I looked up, the, I, I went to the same places. I looked at books on dinosaurs. I looked at books on sharks. And I looked at books on magic. And in the 70s, there weren't a lot of amazing books on magic. There was, uh, there was you know, there was Hovey Burgess's book on juggling, which was a really important book that was part of, with uh, Juggling for the Complete Klutz that got me into juggling. And Bill Severin, if I remember, was the author of a whole bunch of magic books. And I just loved reading through them and learning how tricks worked and unsuccessfully trying them out on people. But either my grandparents or my parents, and I think it was my grandparents, had this book, Magic with Science. And I can't tell you how important this book is to young me and my makeup like who I am. Um, this is written by Walter Gibson, and I want to tell you who illustrated by Rick Estrada. I should look up Rick Estrada because these illustrations of like these characters in here, there's a, there's a deeply physical way in this book that it depicts things. And, oh God, look at this. This is about being able to float a coin on water using only surface tension. And like, that is, that's a world-class illustration in my opinion. Um, here's about using a paper towel uh, and uh, 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 the wick effect to make, to make a siphon that moves water from a uh, glass down. Now, we didn't have phones in the 70s. <laughs> we barely had television. Um, oh my God, everything in... So th this was entertainment, right? We'd go to my grandparents' house and it wasn't like my grandparents were gonna play with us. That's not what they did. They were practically Victorian. Um, no, this book was there and you just read this book again and again and again. And you're like, you tried out everything in it. And I will tell you that I tried absolutely everything in this book over the course of my childhood. Um, there are things about like how cone, how uh, uh, cylinders are actually can make something like paper very strong, uh, or how bending something into an accordion can make it structural. Here is how to do the classic straw goes in a bottle and somehow holds the bottle up trick. Now some of these are like. Some of these are rudimentary magic tricks that are, that are in every compendium of magic tricks. The difference here is that where a lot of rudimentary magic tricks exploit unexpected physics, this book speaks directly to the physics. That's its purpose. And so there's a really key way. Oh my God, check out, check out this illustration for doing this trick about blocks falling off threads. I mean, just like when you look at that, 
One can argue that my entire drawing style today is based on this kind of illustration. Um, it is, uh, ah, here's one I can still do, dropping a wine cork and having it land on its end. There it is in this book. Is there a clearer way to show that effect, that trick? It, it, it's all here. It's all here. A slight bias towards one side of the drop of the cork so it falls not perfectly level and thus gets a little bit of impetus to land on its end. It's totally doable. You can practice it and you can get good at it. Um, it is great that we have YouTube and TikTok and other mediums for young people to learn how the world works to get answers to the questions they have. And nothing quite replaces doing it yourself. I will tell you that there are aspects of this book, there are physics things in this book that I directly utilized on Mythbusters. Yeah, here's one about the running water, pulling things towards it. That was absolutely something that, so what watching something on a channel or reading something gives you is information. And that's absolutely critical to learning. But what trying something out gives you is intuition. And intuition, let's, let's, let's talk about intuition. Um, because it's one of the ways we cut through a lot of possibilities. You know, if you've built a bunch of things out of wood and someone wants you to build something out of wood that you haven't built before, well, the fact that you built a bunch of stuff out of wood means that you have some intuition about how the material is going to move. That, that intuition is going to aid and abet you doing things you don't know how to do. And there was something there, like, as I, as I, so I bought this on Amazon. It's not in print anymore. It was like 40 bucks. Um, and it's amazing. And as I read through it, I realized that over the course of my childhood, I read every single page of this book multiple times and followed every single illustration to try something. There's one in here about blowing out a candle that is, um, that has a wine bottle in front of it. And it's the fact that wind moves nicely around round things where it doesn't around square things or that air currents move aerodynamically around round things. I'm trying, ah, there it is, there it is. That absolutely came into, into one of the stories we were doing. And just by trying everything in this book made me a better science communicator almost 40 years later. This is a stunner. Um, yeah, it, it's I, this one, which is putting needles in a balloon without it bursting. And you do this by putting little bits of scotch tape on there so it keeps the rubber from going away, but it allows you to stick hat pins in a balloon. I think I did this probably 20 times and showed my family. They were so indulgent. <laughs> um, you know, and despite that about intuition, I will say that one of the things that made Jamie Heineman made, it's not past tense. One of the reasons Jamie Heineman is among the better engineers I have ever worked with is because he has literally no intuition. Frankly, that's the thing that's most amazing to me about Jamie is he's like unwilling to take what he thinks he knows and build off of it. He's got to try it all. And frankly, that has a purity to it that means he comes up with solutions that I would have thrown out. And I learned a lot from watching him do that. Uh, yeah, full stop. And, and trying stuff out for yourself is so important as a, as a co-practice to just watching stuff and learning how it's done. 
Yeah. I mean, one of the most common questions I get is about new skill acquisition. What is your process? Uh, and it is threefold. The first thing I do is I think of something I want with that process. If I don't want something from that process, I'm not really going to be invested in it. In it. The second thing is I read everything I can about that process until it starts to kind of make sense to me. And then the third step is I try it. <clears throat> and the trying of it is likely to be some part of a disaster. Uh, and yet it will give me the in information that I need to actually build my intuitive brain to understand how to extrapolate the lessons learned to more parts of the process. Um, and that's just you just got to keep on trying that stuff. God, one of the most satisfying moments uh, for me was um, in the mid nineties, I made my first bull whip uh, out of uh, seven inch Latigo cowhide. And it wasn't, it's not that beautiful. It still exists. Good. I gave it to a good friend of mine. Uh, he still has it. But um, when I finally got David Morgan, uh, the maker of the whips from Raiders of the Lost Ark, when I finally reached out to his company and he graciously gave me 90 minutes of his time on the telephone, uh, and like I had bought this book on leather braiding to build this whip. And when it came time to wrap the belly, which is this long triangle of leather that goes around each of the braided plates, um, the book that I had just said you lay in the belly and then you braid over it. And it's like this big triangle and all these braids and I needed some measure of control over it. So I used a waxed twine to hold the belly over the previous braided plates and it worked. It worked great. And when I checked in with David Morgan, he was like, yes, that is another way that whip makers do that. Um, that's me using the intuition of my material knowledge to augment the information that I have. And it was very satisfying to be confirmed that I that I got that right. Um, it's hard to overestimate the importance of this book to me as a maker and as a science communicator. Um, and now I'm going to, after the video, because I'm ridiculous about this, I am going to, uh, I'm going to absolutely look up the author, Walter Gibson, and the illustrator, uh, again, Rick Estrada. Just amazing. Okay, <laughs> everybody stop what you're doing. Walter B. Gibson turns out to be a real character. Uh, Wikipedia, born in 1897, he died in 1985. This book came out a year after I was born in 1968. Uh, he was a magician, a professional magician, um, and best known for his work on the character the shadow. Who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men? The shadow knows. This was a radio drama. Um, and Bill Gibson wrote more than 300 novel length shadow stories, writing up to 10,000 words a day. Uh, and the, co the couple lived in New York State. My goodness. Um, Yeah, there was a Shadow Pulp magazine and Gibson wrote for that magazine. That is really cool. There we go. And Rick Estrada is also really cool. Uh, he were, he was a comic book artist born in Havana, Cuba. Um, my goodness. Through his uncle, Sergio Carbo, he met Ernest Hemingway and the two men facilitated... Estrada's move to New York City in 1947 to start his career. Uh, he attended the Art Students League, NYU, SVA, School of Visual Arts in New York. Um, he lived in Greenwich Village. My God, I'll bet my dad knew him. Um, he penciled and inked Butler, Rough Riders. He worked for Marvel. Um, yeah, a master artist, a master at his craft. And frankly, like I said, the physicality of his drawings, uh, the way in which they communicated their concepts so quickly and efficiently. Oh, look at that. Dude, I can't even tell you. That is like burned into my 10-year-old brain, that illustration. Every illustration in here. Um, I would love to know some of your favorite childhood books that shaped you. Yeah, put them in the comments. Um, I'm, I'm looking for more books from my maker library. Thank you guys for joining me for this. It's been a real joy to go back over this material. I will see you next time.
Hey guys, Adam Savage from Tested here. If you've ever seen the six inch ruler in inches and centimeters on my forearm and wanted one of your own, but you didn't want it to be permanent, well, today's your lucky day. You can now buy temporary tattoos of my measuring stick, my measuring forearm, uh, at tested-store.com. Comes like this, goes on in about 30 seconds with a little water. The instructions are on the back. It comes off with rubbing alcohol, and hopefully it warms you up to the idea of permanently attaching a measuring device to your body, because I use mine every single day.